So a quick introduction of Ustaorg. Um, Ustaorg is a not-for-profit environmental organization based in Hong Kong. Our aim is to bring attention to what's happening to natural ecosystems worldwide. We advocate for sustainable economic policies, for the protection of the natural environment, and an extension of governance or oversight to cover the global commons. With us to org talks, we are engaging with inspiring change makers and thought leaders to share their opinion and knowledge, its knowledge with our global audience, all to bring attention to what we humans are doing to our planet. For the audience, I'd like to welcome Nathaniel Rich, a novelist and essayist who has written essays and reviews for Vanity Fair, the New York Times Magazine, Rolling Stones, and is a regular contributor to Atlantic Harpers. He is well known for his last book, Losing Earth, A Recent History, released in 2019, which focused on the scientific evidence for global warming and climate change. Nathaniel's latest book, Second Nature, was officially released in March 2021, and it tell, tells 10 poignant tales that depict how humans are transforming nature. Thank you so much, Nathaniel, for being with us here today. Thanks for having me. Great. We are fascinated by the 10 scenes of the so-called second nature presented in your book and really enjoyed encountering the scientific themes of climate change in individual stories. Your narratives are based on the experiences of real people, which is what we think makes this book so appealing and so powerful. The title of the book alludes to a world remade in a process of the modification of the environment, almost entirely directed by humans. Why have humans come to believe ourselves justified in this notion of remaking the world for our benefits? Yeah, well, the, the lineage of this, this idea really goes back to the beginning of, of civilization, human civilization. Um, you know, the human intervention in the natural world uh, started at, from the beginning, um, you know, once we started rearranging landscapes uh, to, to suit our, our dwellings and, and um, interacting with the animal life and, and, and forests and, um, and so on. And, and really from the beginning, there has been this idea um, ingrained in human society. I mean, this is not every single human society, but for the most part, uh, the idea has been uh, that human beings uh, are made to dominate the natural world. You see this in the, you know, in the Bible, you see this in ancient myth. And there has been a kind of war against uh, nature, uh, what we think of as nature um, from the beginning and um, an effort to subdue uh, wildlife and, and sub subdue natural environments um, in, in an effort to make it more suitable uh, or comfortable to human life. And, and that relationship has only shifted um, really in the last couple centuries um, with the emergence of an understanding of how much destruction uh, we've we've done, and so you see a shift beginning in the in the you know middle late nineteenth century, thinkers like Alexander von Humboldt and his disciples, um, George Perkins Marsh, um, you know Thoreau, John Muir later, um, and and you start to see uh, a sense that you know all of this all of this uh, subdu subduing has actually done great harm and and undermined a lot of the natural processes that we we need to uh, survive on this planet. Uh, and then you have the birth of the environmental movement and a sense of uh, wanting to return to where, uh, where we started or to so at least some previous state of harmony with, with the natural world. Although you know, I think one thing I write about is there really has never been much harmony to begin with. And, and so now you have this, this new way of thinking that we can use these same powers um, that we've, we've used to exploit the land and, and to extract resources and to dominate uh, wildlife and, and natural terrains and use the, those same technologies to try to restore uh, what we've lost. And that's what I'm, I'm writing about is both the sort of hubris of this and, and um, you know, the, 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 some of the, the, the vanity and, and craziness that ensues from some of these, these larger projects to, to restore a lost uh, environment and also um, sadly the necessity of massive intervention in order to undo um, or at least um, mitigate some of these great damages we've inflicted. Yeah, it's, it's um, I, I think that uh, you're currently in New Orleans, right? It's where you're based. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that's fascinating. I mean, if, if there was ever one, one place in the world which is uh, def trying to defy nature and the, and the power of the Mississippi, you know, it's uh, New Orleans. And, and I, I guess, um, 
you know, obviously that came really to a head with, with Hurricane Katrina. Um, and you're, do you, you know, while we think we can better control nature, uh, I mean, I think Hurricane Katrina and maybe the aftermath, and there was a lot of debate in New Orleans, I think, around whether, whether places should be abandoned or whether they should be re, you know, taken back and, and, and better protected. Uh, you know, do you think events like that can trigger more thoughtful reflections on, on our relationships to nature? Yeah, well, I mean, I should say the debates weren't in New Orleans. Nobody in New Orleans thought it was a good idea to abandon the city, but you right. did start to see um, some national politicians, right-wing politicians in the U.S. Um, making that argument. Um, now, you know, the, as you said, New Orleans is a city that is, you know, it's, it's a nickname for it is the impossible city. It's a city in a place where there really should not be a city. We're on a marsh. It's constantly subsiding, uh, surrounded by water. Um, and now we have the sea encroaching because of the, the devastation of, of the wetlands south of, of New Orleans, which is the, our barrier from the Gulf of Mexico uh, and sea level rise. And so the city of the city, its entire history has has been in this um, battle against against the natural elements yeah. uh, to try to just exist. So this is really nothing new. And, and I think one fascinating thing about living here. Um, you know, it's a city that's so identified with, um, it has this image of this place lost in time and, and, you know, that's valid for a number of reasons, but it's also, it feels very much like we're living here in the future because the people who live in Southern Louisiana are already um, on good terms with this, this idea that, you know, any summer could be our last, uh, you know, any hurricane could be our last, uh, that we're living in this perilous condition that I think more and more people in all parts of the world will be feeling in the, in the decades ahead because of climate change. Um, you know, to your question, could one disaster uh, shift people's views about this? I think uh, to some extent it can, although one has to be careful because with Katrina, um, you know, came back, but other people, um, you know, came and other people Renew, it renewed people's commitment to the city. Uh, and, and I think what we've seen over and over again in these last years of just incredible devastation because of wildfires and hurricanes all over the world, um, it may be that people in the communities affected um, start to sort of get religion about climate change and, and climate policy, um, but, it's, but everybody else kind of forgets about it as soon as the disaster rolls over. And so I, I, I always, struggle, I, I question the, the, the logic of um, relying on disasters to motivate people because we've had so many and, and um, you know, too, many, too much of the populace are in places that uh, won't feel immediate uh, risk from climate change in the next couple decades uh, to motivate the larger polity, you know, to, to act on major climate policy, the kind yeah. of policy we need. So it might be felt locally, but not necessarily spread right across the, the depopulation, right across the whole population. Yeah, I mean, Louisiana yeah. is an interesting model because, you know, in Southern Louisiana, out, New Orleans is, you know, heavily democratic city, but, but the rest of, of Louisiana is uh, not. Most of it is, is not heavily Republican. <laughs> and, and yet when you're in the coastal parishes, um, people there don't, are not climate deniers. You know, people oh. in Plaquemines Parish, south of New Orleans, one of the most endangered you know, places in the world from sea level rise. They're not climate deniers, um, and because they've lived the experience, they remember, you know, not too long ago when the water was much farther away from their homes, and they didn't have to elevate their houses on, on, um, you know, ten feet up in the air or seventeen feet up in the air. Um, but, uh, and I think that's true with with climate change generally. The further you go down from the sort of national, at least in the U.S., from the national Republican Party down to the local level. Um, the, the tenacity uh, that people hold on to this idea that climate change is, isn't important or isn't real, um, I think it starts to loosen. And, and um, so, so, you know, I think you see in Louisiana some more interesting and more sophisticated uh, grapplings with these issues um, because it's, it's, it's right in everyone's face. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think similarly, the, the Republican... Uh, in Miami, I think he's city, city, city mayor, you know, he, he's now said it's real, it's here, we're dealing with it every day. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, I guess. Well, that, 
that's that's the whole uh, Rafe Pomerantz is this this um, you know basically the first climate activist. He's the the hero of, of uh, my book Losing Earth. His his uh, main um, activities these days are, are for this this Florida group, um, and where their their idea is to target Republican uh, Floridians yeah. who are not climate deniers and and try to and they're also the most imperiled you know by by sea level rise. In these coastal uh, counties and trying to try to get use use those Republicans um, office holders as a lever to try to shift the national party. Um, you know, we'll see if it's successful, but I think it's a it's it makes sense. It's, a, it's an interesting strategy. It's using um, it as a lever to try to shift the national discussion. Yeah, I think that when when a threat becomes tangible and the threat is about livelihoods, then you know, there's some common ground, really, if, if, if it's considered in those ways, the risks uh, of, of what might be coming, you know, that that's when environmentalists and potentially the more right wing can actually find some common ground. That's 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 the hope. Um, but um, yeah, we, we digress. Let's let's have the, let's have the, the next question, which is uh, in, in your book, you, you write about the genetic modifications and engineering and even the reincarnation of species. You know, such as you know, talked about the green rabbit, uh, the passenger pigeon, the attempt to resuscitate or bring back, not resuscitate, but bring back the passenger pigeon. You know, these are kind of fascinating. They're kind of deeply fascinating. Why do you think we we find them so fascinating? The, the idea that we can kind of control nature and maybe make it make it in our as we wish. You know, it's, uh, do you think it's playing God and could have unforeseen consequences? It's definitely playing God. Um, it's it, it's it's um explicitly so i mean i take the ch the title of this final section of second nature yeah. um as gods from the Stuart brand uh quote Stuart brand uh figure in the book the founder of the whole earth catalog um and leading one of the this, this major de-extinction movement to bring back species using genetic technologies mm. and uh you know and his his line the 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 line that it comes from is is you know we are as gods and we have to get good at it you know, we have, I might have flubbed one of the words there, but, you know, essentially, like, we already have these godlike powers, and now we have a responsibility to exert them responsibly, and not just, like, uh, you know, Ragnarok or something, or uh, yeah. Kali and, and the god of destruction, as we have, have been doing. And um, I think the, uh, the, the story, the, the species are fascinating also on purpose. You know, they've chosen savvily they've they've looked for charismatic species it's they've looked mm. for species that that um capture the public imagination uh which is not a new idea you know either that goes back to the beginning of the conservation movement is that um if you're fundraising if you're trying to make a political statement if you're trying to get attention um you don't choose some you know obscure uh, salamander to save, you choose the woolly mammoth, you know, you choose the passenger pigeon, which was at one point the most populous bird uh, in all of North America, perhaps the world. Um, you choose iconic uh, animals and, and, the, and the point is very much symbolic. Um, mm. it's, it's, of course, there's, there are, are very strong ecological justifications for bringing back these species that, that they make. Um, but but really, it's it's almost. This is where I get. I, I find it, it, this story gets really interesting to me. Is it is almost more more of an art uh, project than it is a scientific project. Of course, it is a scientific project, and it, using cut you know cutting edge genetic technology um, and all of that. But they're really trying to capture um, the public imagination, and they've they've largely succeeded. I mean, mm. they've probably been more. Um, you know, magazine articles and news stories committed to, to uh, Stuart Brand's group, Revive and Restore, than, um, you know, any, any other recent scientific endeavor, and they haven't even released a species yet into the wild, um, although they're getting closer and closer. And, and I think that's important. I don't, I, it, you know, it, I don't think it's um, frivolous. I think, I think there's value in, um, in, in, in art and, and, and this, these weird art, artistic science um, projects uh, in, in engaging the human imagination because we, you know, we get so stuck 
uh, in our ways and in our view of the world that we forget that everything that we see uh, is completely artificial and, and human made. Um, you know, we think of as forests or wild places to give one example, national parks um, oh. are all there. They've been designed to, to look the way they are, right? There's, there's nothing uh, on the planet that is, uh, can, can honestly be described as, you know, untouched or pristine nature we've 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 touched every you know square inch of the of the of the of the world with our our activities uh and our emissions uh and so on and so um i think one has to have to it's not just about passing the right policies it's also about engaging people and engaging their imagination uh to try to open up new uh ideas of what might be possible and 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 frankly to just you know increase the ambition uh, of, of, of what might be possible, because what we need is a really quite a radical um, shift in the way that we live on this planet. Uh, and, and it's not enough just to simply say, um, you know, let's conserve these, these extra 100 acres here and there. Yeah, I, I had a super interesting conversation with Roman Krasnarek. I, I don't know if you if you if you read his book, but just in terms of that reference to artistic projects, to, to, to how they can play a part in culture in terms of uh, kind of seeding the cultural uh, universe to, to help people think differently. It's, you know, I think there are many ways to, to, to try and achieve this goal of shifting people's thinking. And I think art, art can play this part uh, incredibly powerfully. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's why I chose you know, to end the book on the final, the final stories about this, this green rabbit, as you referenced, and it's um, this, this bio artist, he calls himself, uh, Eduardo Katz, yeah. Brazilian uh, American artist who um, created this project of, a, of an albino rabbit that had been um, dyed with genetic uh, material to, to glow in the dark green. And, you know, it's, it, it, it was a huge scandal and, and, and there was a lot of concern that he was, you know, playing God, that he was um, using a poor little bunny rabbit as an art project and exploiting, uh, you know, life for his work. And, um, and of course the, the, you know, the reality was that he actually hadn't done anything. Um, the, the rabbit already had been, uh, engineered in a lab in France and he was just bringing it out to the public. And, right. and there were rabbits like this that were essentially mass produced in this lab for scientific, uh, purposes. And, um, his contribution was simply to, Pull, pull back the curtain and, and let everybody uh, have a conversation about it. In fact, his, he, he insisted his, the art project was really not so much the rabbit itself as the public debate that he hoped to inspire uh, and that he succeeded in inspiring. And, and that's the kind of, um, you know, that, that for me felt like the, is a kind of story of our time that we're at a, at a moment in history where, um, you know, tremendous technological changes are, are underfoot and yet most of the public with, with, you know, with, with dramatic stakes for, you know, what's going to happen in the future of this planet and, and civilization and, and the, and yet most of the public is completely oblivious of what, you know, what's going on, both what's at stake uh, and what kind of new interventions are coming uh, and what the, what the possible outcomes might be. And it sometimes does take a kind of kooky artist uh, uh, or, or, you know, a gimmicky, uh, art project to, to try to, to, to bring those worlds together and, and create a public debate. And I think until we have a, a greater public reckoning with, with where we are, uh, not only in terms of climate change, but really in terms of our, this, this larger um, ecological derangement of the planet, uh, we can't hope to have any kind of meaningful you know, policy or, or, or shift uh, in the way we live on it. Yeah, I, I wonder just on the flip side, you know, is there a, is there a sense that some could misconstrue it so that they can see animals being recreated, they could see maybe species being brought back and they think, you know, could it could it be that that sense that technology can fix it, you know, that 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 we can kind of put it right. Um, and that maybe that might allow more damage or, or the shift to the shift, the, the real shift in thinking to take longer to to, to, to come about. Yeah, that's, that's a concern that you um, especially in some environmental activist circles that um, this, this fear of relying on a, a technological fix and, yeah. um, you know, that if, yes, if people, people will feel solace in the fact that, oh, we can just bring back woolly mammoths, so we don't need to worry about, you know, 
Um, that of course is you know rejected pretty vociferously by by proponents of these technologies. I think I think if you step one steps back um, and and sort of taken on view of the situation, I think we're we're far enough along in mm. in this timeline now. Um, where you know the period I was writing about in Losing Earth in the 1980s, um, yes, if we had taken some of the major policy steps that were then being proposed, um, we wouldn't have to worry about perhaps some of these these massive interventions. But we're decades past that, and and you know the uh, just to take the climate issue alone, you know the CO2 in the atmosphere has more than doubled since when. Um, uh, or the, the fossil fuel CO2 emitted by human beings have almost more than doubled since since 1989, um, and and so we're we're at a point where we have there will have to be major type, major interventions, and the question is not you know do we try them or not it's it's how do we do them well, uh, responsibly, uh, and that conversation hasn't really begun, and so I think one has to be a little bit honest about you know yeah. what we're up against. Um, and, and I think finally, I think that, that, you know, the revive and restore people would say the more attention, the more energy you draw to these issues, whether it's, you know, extinction uh, or climate change, um, the more people are engaged, um, the more atten you know, the more attention all of this will get. And um, it's not a, it's not a, a, a zero sum game that, yeah. you know, if, if you have people thinking about these issues, uh, the goal is to get more people engaged and more people's imaginations engaged. Yeah, yeah. I, I do you think that do you think there could be like a moral case that actually because we were responsible for the passenger pigeon's extinction in the first place that therefore, you know, we there's a moral case to say that we should be looking to to uh, to yeah. bring it back. That Stuart Brand makes that argument. Right. Uh, I mean, I think that was from the very the genesis of the idea. When he was just sort of throwing it around in a in a public conversation, he said, "Well, you know, we sort of do have a moral responsibility to bring these species back since we've destroyed them." Um, and I think there's something to that. Um, I think the moral calculus is a little it it gets a little complicated um, when you get into you know th there's a suggestion. I'm going to give you a sort of somewhat semi-apocryphal example, just because it's it's right on my, it relates the passenger pigeon, um, but it, I think it stands for a larger larger you know issue, which is that yep. there's been theories that you know the, pa the passenger pigeon was at one point um, there are insane numbers of pigeons in the continent, you know, billion flocks of billions would fly overhead for you know weeks at a time, and um, so nobody thought they could ever go extinct. They're just a scourge, um, you know filling the sky for days and and there's a theory that the only reason there were so many passenger pigeons in the first place was because of the ways that human settlement had changed the continent over the centuries and that it had created conditions where this one species started to dominate and, and proliferate in insane numbers and so you know the question could be yes we killed them but then maybe we also were responsible for them becoming so numerous in the first place, so then where do you where do you adjust? You know what's what's the what's the natural state of things? Where do you where do you put your marker? And you can say that for almost any population or species, um, you know, is the marker how things were in 1930? Are they how things were in, uh, you know, 30 A.D. Where they how things were you know 10,000 years ago? Um, and 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 that's where you have to sort of there's sort of another godlike aspect of it where it's not only about undoing the wrong or, or, or fixing something that we've done. It's also about determining, well, what is the ideal state? You know, what mm -hmm. is the Edenic state? Um, I think the passenger pigeon example, uh, as I said, is not perfect because I think there's some question that idea that it was humans that caused them to proliferate in the first place. But, but you see this kind of issue raised um, over and over again. The Mississippi River is another one. Well, it sh shifted course every year. You know, so what's the right? Yeah. Where should it go? And and you know, um, so that that's that's very much a subject of second nature too. Is it's not only about identifying the wrongs that need to be uh, repaired. It's really about it's really about creating, deciding what is um, the ideal state of things and and imposing it. And and there's something very scary about that 
uh, and, and vain about that idea too, but, but yet a lot of these choices require one to make a judgment of that kind. Say, well, this is the ideal amount of acreage a forest should have. And so we'll, we'll get it there. Yeah, I think that there, there, you know, some environmentalists, um, you know, have concluded that, you know, that you need to create zones without humans. I mean, there, there is that this, this kind of, you know, that that's really the only way is to, is to try and at least in certain areas. So there are pockets which, which resemble what might be the might have been pre pre human kind of balance of nature. Well, and that's a great example of what I'm talking about because, um, yeah, you have the most famous example of that is uh, E.O. Wilson's ideas yeah. of dividing the planet um, so that 50% is, is forest. But of course, you first have to identify which 50%. You have to pretty, um, you have to go into those areas and police them, you know, surveil them. You have to put boundaries around them. Um, and then you also have to, um, the whole rewilding ethos that that comes out of also requires massive intervention to remove species that shouldn't be there, mm. um, you know, to sometimes introduce uh, new species to keep other species out. Uh, and so there's still, you're, you're still very actively farming this land in a way. And so this idea of just leaving half of the planet um, uh, alone is actually um, deceptive because really what they're talking about is creating a, like a massive zoo for half of the planet. And, and it might be a good idea, but it's, it's not, it's certainly not um, non-interventive. It's, it's heavily interventive. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, uh, I, I think it sort of raises the concept of sharing and, and, and what's, what's, what's reasonable and fair and, and, and how do we perceive that, um, um, Kind of um, not only for sharing it with future generations, and I think there's that that very interesting question around intergenerational um, 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 balance, um, so that so that you know, and sharing it with other other human species in the planet and the resources that we have, which are often conflicted or at least uh, competitively pressurized, and and then also with the animal kingdom. So there's a whole layers of of, of associated that, and I I, I loved um, Edward Wilson's Half Earth, and and thought it was. But I, I agree, you know, to, to intervene to that extent, is, is that possible? Uh, or, or would it be better to have some valuation on natural capital, which, which then begins to sort of bring it into the economic equation in a way which can, can ensure perhaps it's better protected or better valued? I, it, it's, it's hugely complex. And I think, as you said, it, let alone the climate issue, there's the whole natural capital, um, you know, natural environment. How does that get, how does that find its place um, and, and not just lose, lose out consistently? Yeah, and ultimately it comes down to a question of, of responsibility and, and taking responsibility. And I think too often when these things, these questions are raised in the sort of political discourse, there's um, there's always very strong pressure to sort of shirk responsibility and, and not take action. And and I think it's important to understand that um, any any effective remedy requires. Um, taking action, taking, you know, getting in, involved um, and, and often in, in uncomfortable ways. Um, and so I think we're only beginning to see a, a sort of new generation of leader who's willing to do that on a, at a global level. Yeah, we, we very much hope so. And, and, and I, you know, the, the, the inspiration of the youth movement, I think, in terms of shaming the, the current political generation, you know, as I said, that, that, kind, of, that kind of cultural input can also have have impacts and and we hope that we'll continue to do so. But um, um, you know, just on on the on going back to the to the some of the characters in the book, you know, you you mentioned you know Ben Novak, uh, you know, with the Passenger Pigeon Project, um, Billy Barr, the Hermit, and and you know and and the Billet the Lawful, uh, the lawyer uh, who uncovered the Dupont scandal. Do you, do you? I mean, you must have had a wealth of. I suppose stories that you you wanted to explore into. Did you did you have to leave a lot out, or or you know, were these ten a, a really good collection? Do you have many more? Um, well, I you know I'm really drawn by obsessives, you know, characters yeah. who are are just dedicate their life to something, um, especially you know ones who dedicate their life to eccentric or um, difficult things and. Uh, so the book is full of people like that and, and yeah. uh, sort of dreamers and questers and visionaries and um, uh, monomaniacal um, 
<laughs> maniacs. And, um, you know, and, and I think when we talked, we were just talking about responsibility and engagement. I mean, these are people who are engaged to a level that goes beyond, I think, anything that, you know, one, one normally encounters in, in one's life. And um, I mean, Billy Barr is, I'm glad you, I'm glad you uh, named him. He's someone who, he's not central to this, to this story. It's, it's part of a, right. so he doesn't come up often in conversations about the book, but he's one of my favorite figures. He's this um, mountain hermit, basically, uh, with a long white beard. And it, it's part of a larger story about uh, Aspen and, and the Rocky Mountains and, and how they're losing their snow and um, about the, this, this very wealthy um, ski town of Aspen trying to become a climate, global climate leader and um, stop climate change in order to, to preserve its, um, you know, ski, ski mountains. And, uh, and right over the mountains from Aspen, there's this, this fascinating research uh, laboratory out in, the, in, the, in an old, um, in a ghost town, basically, called Gothic. And I got to go there and it, it was one of the most beautiful places um, I've ever been. It's at the very top of a mountain valley. And it's just it's a bunch of shacks sort of going up the up the ravine um, on either side of this this brook, and over the summer it's this it's this major um, center of research and activity and um, you know graduate students I think some younger kids come out have sort of science camps there and then there's like forty or fifty scientists uh, who use it as a research station and they study basically everything you you know the flowers the animals the the trees. Um, in the valley and, and some of the most valuable uh, research into uh, global warming has gone on there because they have these experiments that last decades um, where they measure how things are growing you know, every year and these extremely ambitious multi-generational science experiments. But in the winter time, everyone leaves because uh, it's freezing and, and covered with snow <laughs> and the only the dirt road that goes up the hill from another ski town it's called Crested Butte, which is way down the bottom of the valley. Um, is completely impassable. And so the only person who stays is, the, is this, um, the maintenance guy, basically, Billy Barr, his gender. And he's, he's been there for something like 50 or 60 years now. He came right after college and he never left. And he has this long white, you know, he looks like Father Winter. Um, and he, he lives in this one shack by himself. Every, I think, couple of months, he skis out and to get uh groceries and whatever he needs for the rest of the winter. Um, and he's not himself a scientist, but through his just, um, you know, his passion for this environment, he's taken these obsessive notes uh, and diaries about what he sees every winter when he's there by himself in his cabin. Uh, and so he, he tracks, you know, the first appearance of, of snow, the first avalanche. Um, there's tons of avalanches in this valley. Uh, you know, he measures the snow, uh, the first flower, you know, all of that. And, and these records have, are, are now have become over 50, 60 years, one of the most valuable um, climate records that we have. And he also has the, the avalanche diary is, is also, I think, in a, a special achievement. He, he's like charted every avalanche for 50 years in the valley and extremely valuable for people who study that kind of thing, I suppose. Um, so he, that was one example of a story that it wasn't enough just to write, you know, for him to be a small figure in the larger story of Aspen. I, I ended up actually writing a short story um, that's essentially about him, although he's not named. Um, that was published last, last year, I think, in Esquire uh, in the UK. But it, yeah. it, it so captured my imagination that um, I couldn't close. But yeah, there's a lot of characters like that in the book. And that, that, that for me is the most exciting part of writing these stories is, is going um, deep into the lives of these people. Because I think for any of these stories to work, it's not just enough to explain you know, what's happening scientifically or culturally in any of these places, but um, they're really personal stories about, about these individuals who have dedicated their lives to um, insane causes and 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 that's where i think a lot of the fun of the the book comes the humor the drama um the excitement yeah the level of engagement because of the, the personal nature of the stories i think it's it's it is exactly what you said it's what makes the book so so engaging um and in your 
I get these are stories you probably came across over over a couple of years. I mean, you have or or, or maybe you've been tracking for a while and always wanted yeah, to write write about them. Yeah, yeah, more than I mean, some of the stories are uh, I started working on more than ten years ago. I would say. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It has that feel. Um, did, did you? Did were you always this engaged in the in the environmental question? Is it something that's been growing? Um, you know, how how do you how do you how do you see your what's your journey in terms of uh, getting involved in these things? Yeah, I, I think, I, you know, I, it, it, there wasn't some kind of big moment. I mean, it, I kind of feel like I came in through the back door or something where I, I wasn't, um, when I started writing these stories, becoming interested in these stories uh, in Second Nature, I wasn't, I didn't even identify them as environmental stories. Mm. Um, I, I found myself being drawn, I, you know, I guess if you had asked me at the time when I was writing, you know, the Aspen story or, um, some of the earliest things I was working on, like one of New Orleans stories, um, I was really drawn to a sense of the uncanny, uh, a sense of kind of weirdness, I guess, mm. would probably be my <laughs> first version of, of answering this question. Just yeah. A sense of being unsettled, uh, uh, lack of resolution. You know, I, I, I'm not interested in the sort of good guy, bad guy stories. I mean, there's one story, the, the Rob a lot story about DuPont is, is probably the one exception. It's the first story in the book and it's just such a shocking, crazy story um, that it, I think it's still, uh, you know, it, it, it still obsessed me even though you do have this like heroic uh, lawyer against this, uh, you know, Goliath uh, DuPont chemical company that's poisoning the whole world. Um, but apart from, that's the closest I get to sort of good versus evil it's and, black and, and white actually, right yeah yeah black and white and and but really what the 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 main thrust of the book and, and most of the other stories really are about um with stories where there's some kind of inherent uh tension dramatic tension mm. where there's not a clear answer there's not a clear resolution and yet people are trying to muddle through um and so you know an example you know the passenger pigeon story is a good example um Aspen story is another example where you say, well, who are these rich, you know, assholes, if I can say that, uh, trying to, <laughs> trying to tell us like to solve climate change when they have like a hundred private jets flying into their town, into their mountain every day, and they're importing water from Iceland and so on. Um, and then you say, well, actually they do have the power and resources to, um, you know, to achieve some of these ambitious things that we need to achieve. And, 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 and they're real, you know, they understand the hubris of it all and they, they're trying to navigate all that. And, and so it's, um, you know, there, there's stories that left me feeling kind of uncomfortable. And I find that's where, you know, that tension usually leads to, to, to sort of high, higher drama. And um, I feel like we're, by writing the stories, I, my way of trying to come to terms or un, resolve that tension that I feel um, and so, so those are the stories that stay with me that, that I can't get out of my head and that I end up writing about. Right. Um, it's, it was it, only later that I, I identify, I said, oh, these are all <laughs> environmental in some way that they're all stories about essentially what I've been writing about is the way that we've completely transformed the planet, uh, to suit our, our own, um, you know, preferences with, with disastrous ramifications and we're only now realizing it. And so, yeah you know, the, the weirdness of, of this world we've created for ourselves is, is, is ultimately the, the subject of the book. And that's a deeply unsettling idea. Yeah, I, I suppose, you know, recent examples would be the civil engineering works, uh, you know, in Chicago or in, in New Orleans, and uh, compounded by the cutting of new canals, like, as you said, in the Plaquemines district, and, and you know, which is just so, so idiotic it seems it seems um incredulous that it was allowed to happen but as you said and all the way through to what may be happening now in terms of science and genetic splicing that in the future could have uh, knock-on consequences or 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 unforeseen side effects that that could lead to further interventions it does it does seem to to get quite scary and quite messy when you when you think of it through yeah it does i mean the canals are a funny example because yes it's it's building a bunch of oil canals, uh, cutting a bunch of canals through the marsh south of New Orleans has led to, you know, losing 2,000 square feet of, of land has been a major contributor and, and, you know, putting at risk all of southern Louisiana from, from hurricanes and sea level rise. And yet the solution 
is to cut more canals, basically. It's to create yeah. um, new diversions of the Mississippi River to pump more water and sediments um, into these depleted marshes. And so it doesn't see, you know, like so much in this, so many of these stories, you know, at first, your first brush with it doesn't sit right. You know, it doesn't feel right. It feels perverse. Um, and yet we're at an, in a perverse time and you realize that, oh, um, you know, it's not a matter of trying to use, you know, technology to undo the, 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 da the damage that technology has done, but there's almost a, a sense that, you know, we have to do everything else as well. We have to conserve, we have to use less, we have to change our policy, but we're also far enough along that, you know, that's not enough. And that, that's, that's an understanding that is not so radical. I mean, that's, that's the IPCC um, yeah. models all are, are do that too. They assume some level of carbon removal from the atmosphere, even though the technology is not, not invented yet, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so, and yet it's, it, when one talks about it in a kind of casual way, it does, it, it, it does make, you know, it does seem uncomfortable. And, and that's, that's, but that's, what's fascinating to me. It's like, we're at, our society is at a place that's very uncomfortable and we're only starting to realize, to grapple with this and understand what, you know, what our, our new responsibilities are. Yeah. Do you think we have the, um, do you think we're sophisticated and grown up enough to do that responsibly? Some, some of us are, uh, <laughs> some are not. I guess it depends who's in power, who, who yeah. can get enough power to, to, to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Our track record's not too good. And yet, um, you know, the, 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 the chain, the rate of change now is really quite astounding. And, um, yeah. you know, even between the time I published the book a few months ago, um, or I guess we finished the, finished the final edit and, and, and between that and publication, um, uh, artificial or lab cultured chicken, which I wrote about, um, you know, using uh, cellular material to, to make like chicken nuggets in the lab uh, for mass consumption without slaughtering any chickens. Uh, that idea, which I wrote about, was was authorized um, to be sold in in, uh, in Singapore as the first market. Yeah. Um, so that this and it'll be in the U.S. Um, I think within a few years, I imagine five or ten years. And so, um, you know, the changes are happening. The awareness is what's lagging. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you depicted some some humans sometimes being an integral part of nature, but at other times being a entirely separate entity in the, in the book, what do you see as an ideal and ethically responsible relationship between humanity and the natural world? Yeah. I mean, that's a big question. I think, I think, I think that of course, human beings are part of, of nature, but I think with that comes a responsibility and, um, and you know, that, that idea also is, is centuries old now, but, but I think, the, the larger question is, you know, what form of what form does that responsibility take? And I, I think it, we're at a point now where um, we have to uh, not leave anything to chance. You know that we have mm. to be extremely, uh, you know, to use the, the horrible buzzword of the time, you know, intentional uh, with with how uh, we act. And what that means is that I think in every kind of policy, from federal policy, international policy, down to um, really individual choice. Uh, one has to take into account um, the global picture and the ecological picture. And so um, I think, you know, in the same way that one, if you, if you care about this stuff at all, or you're aware at all, um, you know, you try not to leave the lights on when you leave the house, <laughs> you know, that basic, basic kind of uh, caretaking, uh, that, that sense of responsibility needs to extend through really, you know, up, up, up to the, to the top. And, and I don't think it really has, um, it hasn't be, we haven't really developed an ethic of environmental stewardship in any kind of broad way. I mean, the close, you know, we have like, a, you know, thanks to efforts in the seventies, there's sort of an anti-litter ethic say, that's sort of the most rudimentary <laughs> version of it that you can see, although it's of course, you know, varying usefulness. Um, but I think that needs to be part of every policy and not just things to, about the environment. I think any kind of economic plan, any kind of health plan, any kind of building plan, any kind of transportation plan, 
um, needs to reflect uh, the the moral uh, the morals the the the, um, the ideals that we we want to uphold and um, you know that certainly hasn't happened although it's that has begun to change in the U S it's it's you see that engagement a little bit more with the Biden administration um, in understanding that climate issues environmental issues are not their own category they're they're integral to every aspect of of our civilization of, of, of policy and yeah, of, of, yeah more broadly speaking yeah absolutely yeah. um i mean in some cases you you've described humans as benevolent masters of sorts who love nature and, and, and i mean is this something that how can we emphasize this and maybe achieve more of it well i think um yes there's some there's some examples of benevolence as you know there's more examples of a kind of tyrannical um, dictatorship, um, but humans again for nature, but, but I think um, you can tell stories. I think you can um, have these conversations. I mean, I think what's, you know, where, I guess where I, where I differ with a kind of mainstream conventional um, environmental activist idea, uh, you know, the, of often environmental activism, you see this, this, I find tedious debate over the years um, between, you know, how, essentially it's this marketing question of how do you get people to, to act and it's, do we make them afraid or do we inspire them with hope? And so, you know, there's a school of thought that says we need to talk about how bad things are, how bad things are getting. Um, but then um, the other school says, no, that'll, that'll just uh, disillusion people and make them, you know, pull back and we should in inspire them with tales of, Hope, you know, the, the wind farm in the in the African village that saves, you know, them from poverty and so on. And I actually, I, you know, I think the whole that that whole binary is is infantile, but but what what I think is more valuable, frankly, is engaging with stories where that are in the middle, <laughs> you know, that are that are difficult, uh, because those really capture the imagination and those I think sink into the unconsciousness or tether tether you know you to to it more so for me i mean you know the, the first one that comes to mind is the story in, in second nature about blackburn's parish and you know this massive infrastructure plan you know the world's biggest climate adaptation plan essentially and which is happening in louisiana now to build land um south of new orleans uh has almost unanimous support but it's it's rejected by one constituency which are the people living on that land that's most endangered by sea level rise that uh, in Plaquemines. And the reason they are so um, hateful about it is that the, the flooding of the marshes will hurt their local fisheries. And most of those people are fishermen and that's how they make their living. And so you have a situation where there's on one hand, this extremely, um, I think thoughtful, prudent, necessary, massive, uh, climate plan that's really a model for the kind of major interventions we are going to need in the decades ahead. Um, and then you have these small group of people who are going to be, you know, genuinely harmed by it. And it's very easy to say, well, you know, that we outnumber them and, and they're, if we don't do anything, their land is going to be gone in 10 years anyway. Um, but there's a moral question here of, you know, how, how can even the most um, sensible plan, if it if it does great harm to a small group of individuals, how do we how do we deal with that, and how do we you know what's the right approach? And that's a it's a difficult. It's not so simple as to say, well, we'll just pay them off and get them to move. You know, we're talking about cultures and tradition and livelihood, and so that kind of moral thorniness, I think, is that's what I, those are the stories we need to tell. Um, and and those are those are the ones that I think really uh, create a conversation uh, that's much more um, fertile than just uh, you know here's a, here's a beautiful heartwarming story about you know the kids who raise money in their lemonade stand to buy solar panels. Yeah, I, I suppose just speaking from our viewpoint enough to org in terms of what you know we where we come from you know the. You know, we do. We believe that individual action is is valid and 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 you know to be admired. Um, but we do think it ha the ch real change has to happen at the policy level and 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 at the governmental level and even on this whole structure of our uh, economic systems and 
um, you know, how, how that economic system interacts with uh, the natural world, which is fundamentally undervalued. So I think that they're, they're you know, they're, they're, that's our kind of viewpoint where we're very much kind of one planet thriving. You know, we, we believe in that rather than techno solutions, but I, but I think it's, it's something that, as you said, you know, it's, it's, you know, how, how do you engage? How do you, how do you show that? How do you demonstrate um, our responsibility? Uh, whether it's to our children or their children, uh, and it's kind of an intergenerational thing that that does really engage with people because they they feel it. They can they can put themselves in their children's shoes, and that's a way in which that thought process is 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 becomes engaging. Um, you know, I, or, or whether it's around risk and just damages to their livelihood. You you mentioned the Aspen example. I, you know, if to some extent, if the rich get slightly or the powerful get inconvenienced, you know, then actually something may happen. Um, it's, it's, as you said, it's, it's maybe not even to be flippant. I mean, that, that, that has a genuine, uh, a, a side to it. Um, that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that those ivory towers need to need to have some, uh, some impacts and, and, and but when they do, things will probably start to shift. Uh, and Aspen's probably a good example, Colorado generally. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think that view is the only, yeah, logical one that of course um, individual action is important, but but we need a, a level of, of of change that that really has to come from governments and um, and governments working together. And uh, and yet, I do wonder whether or not um, and this also seems to be what you're you're saying as well that whether you know can you can you force governments to act. Uh, if the people are not themselves um, individually uh, engaged with the issue, can you know? Can you bring? Can you develop enough of a um, of a popular uh, will um, in order to put the, the pressure necessary uh, to force the kind of? And, and that's where I think some of this individual engagement stuff um, has value because we, we then you do create a stronger ethic or a sense a sensibility about the necessary, uh, the need for, for, you know, radical changes and, and, you know, you try to grow a movement, but I also think it's important to distinguish between the sort of activist, um, motives, uh, which are important and valid. And then the, the writing, you know, the value of literature about these subjects. And, and I find that, you know, one of the reasons I ch I've chosen these issues is also, I, I feel that so much of the writing on these subjects has been driven by um, activism or an activist impulse, which is essentially like, I want to bring these stories, the author wants to bring some stories uh, to the public view in order to inspire action of some kind. Uh, I think that kind of writing is valuable and, and needed, but I also feel that what I do um, is very different in that I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, how does, you know, living in this in this moment uh and becoming aware of the massive both the massive you know damage we've done the the risk ahead of us and, and the opportunity ahead of us how does this uh these anxieties and, and the sort of wonders of this new world that are being created like how, how does that um change who we are as yeah. individuals you know how does yeah. that touch our our own lives our, our personal lives um, you know, very subjective questions that have different answers for any individual, but I feel like there's a role for literature to play there and, and one that's needed, you know, to help each of us try to, you know, sort our way through this, this, you know, morass and, and I feel like there hasn't been enough, um, you know, strong narrative storytelling uh, in, that has engaged these, these themes and, and I feel like that's that's where I'm, that's what I'm trying to activate. It's not that I, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I don't reject any of the activism stuff. I just feel like I'm in a different um, vein. Uh, and I think there's also value in, in art to try to um, help us, you know, better, you know, think, think more clearly about these issues uh, and the ways in which they relate to our own uh, lives, our own inner lives, our personal lives. Uh, and so that's why I've tried to tell the stories in the way that I, I tell them through, you know, really immersive third person uh, storytelling uh, where I'm not a character myself. Uh, and, I, and I feel like that, that, that literature has been, you know, behind. There hasn't, we haven't, there hasn't been enough of that kind of writing on these subjects. And I think there's a great human need uh, for more of it. 
Yeah, I, I, well, I think we, you know, we, I, I definitely personally very much agree. I think the, you know, the environmental activism world is, is having to realize that to, to sort of bang drums or to preach, you know, that, that doesn't work with many people. It doesn't really convert many new people. Um, you know, what, what we're seeing is, is the way that, that, that the environment is being talk, spoken about in, in the me in, in film, in books, in, 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 in art, artistic material is, is, is also very significant. And I think will evolve and maybe accelerate, you know, in terms of whether it's, whether it's future looking fiction, whether it's stories from the future, looking back at the past, um, at to today and, and having a different viewpoint on it. I think those are all ways in which viewpoints can be shifted or, or thinking can be, can be, you can engage with people's thought process and actually have them sort of go down a journey um, just because of the, na the, the engaging nature of the material, the engaging nature of the writing itself um, has that, pulls them along and has that effect on people. So we, we, we really value it. It's one reason why we started the, to do book reviews is because we were interested not only in the environment economics books, but also in the fiction and also in the writing like yours, which is, which is essayist and, and um, storytelling, but in a, in a different perspective, because we, we do see they all have a huge part to play and, and whatever we can do to, to, to bring those to a wider audience is, is, is something that we think is, is, is really positive. So, so I think it's, um, yeah, I think we're on the same page with that one. Um, um, just a few more questions, if, if you have time, Nathaniel, just, uh, to, I think two sure. to three, two more questions, if, if that's good. Uh, yeah, um, sure. That's great. So we, we, in the book, you, you, you've spoken about and, and, number of books that we've uh, authors that we've spoken to recently have written a book during during lockdowns of in various parts of the world and and you know we've we've all seen these stories of the the, the waters of venice being clear and fish fish returning and birds having to sing less loudly and altering their songs because they're not trying to overcome the, the din of traffic and and you know tigers lions stretching across roads that are normally full of traffic i mean it's it's all something that you know, we've, we've seen and kind of enjoyed and, and that, that, you know, do you think that that time spent in some isolation uh, over the last year and the visibility of this uh, revived nature, uh, or at least these pictorially revised nature could leave its mark uh, on our conscience or, or do you think it'll be a kind of passing, passing thing? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I've been fascinated by. Um, and I, I think you know, I I wrote a novel about in part about Philip Kings, you know, about the uh, nineteen eighteen um, flu, and so having having read a lot about that epidemic, um, and now I think now we're sort of hopefully moving out of this one. Um, Did you write that pre COVID? Pre COVID, yes. Right, right. Although it's very, um, yeah, it was published I think twenty eighteen or twenty nine twenty eighteen um, before right before losing Earth. It it. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's disturbing to read, you know, yeah. some of these, uh, the newspaper headlines from the time. And um, yeah, it was strangely, it became a historical novel. It became strangely topical, um, mm. you know, a hundred years later, but the, uh, the and it's set in New Orleans also. Um, but the, I think that one of the big lessons from that flu, and, and I think we're seeing it playing out now, is that once it's over, people want to move on and go back to where things were right before. And there's a kind of yeah. uh, euphoria that sets in as people go back to their old ways. And so I, I'm i reluctant to sort of draw any um, conclusions, I, I guess, at this point, but I, I'm not particularly optimistic about that. But um, one hopes that at least, I think perhaps the greatest contribution is a, is a, a more visceral um, understanding of how closely we're all tied together. Mm. Um, that, you know, what happens in a wet market in Wuhan or maybe a lab in Wuhan um, mm. will, you know, come into your, your, your family's house um, within a couple weeks or months. Um, I think is a very dramatic example of this sort of web of civilization that we've we've built. Uh, so I, I think it might be helpful in the background in that way of reinforcing a sense of a global consciousness for some people who didn't have it before. Um, but I don't, I, I, I don't know, I would be surprised if it leads to the pandemic itself leads to some major um, 
shift in, in environmental policy on a global level. Yeah, I think I think we can, you know, as a as a sort of individual, you can also celebrate the return of nature where humans, you know, when humans pull back and it, it's, it's quaint, it's engaging, it seems charming, but I suppose at the end, everyone says, well, you know, London's going to be full of traffic again and, and there's right. not much we can do about it. So yeah, right. um, I just gave a little glimpse. I suppose it just gave a, gave a glimpse and I suppose reminded us that if we were to disappear completely, then nature would, would take back uh, control pretty quickly. Um, well, there's a wonderful book about that um, by Alan, uh, wise men um the world without us mm, that's yeah. that's plays that out um and that it is a kind of uh it is a kind of fantasy it's almost like a uh there's a wishful a wish fulfillment idea there that that you see in some of the more doomist um environmental uh mm you know, philosophies, uh, you see it in Europe, I know, especially the sort of collapse, collapsology uh, idea. And it's, there's, there's like an, almost an exhilaration uh, at the idea of, of humans, human beings disappearing and nature reclaiming. Um, you know, you see, I think of, I think of also, you know, the J.G. Ballard novel um, that drowned, uh, about the drowned uh, London. Um, and there's, there's a, I think this is a persistent human fantasy that we'll all be, um, will be an apocalypse and we'll, we'll seed the planet back to its, uh, you know, its rightful owners, the animals and, and the plants. Um, but I, yeah, I don't, it, it sort of, it seems to be a constant sort of pillar, but I don't, I don't see it necessarily gaining a kind of broader um, attachment. Do, do you think, do you think there's a sort of guilt? Do you think we, we know we're not, doing good and we're not that good and therefore that that's why we might sort of in the background not hold yeah. it against nature if we if we get beaten in the end i think there's a profound guilt I, I don't think you can help but feel some guilt if you think about think these things through um that inspires a lot of a lot of thought uh, um i think there's also there's also great resistance to the idea of guilt among some people too you know how oh. dare you challenge our, our dominance of the planet. Um, that is a very, you know, core sort of Christian idea, really. Um, and, and, and I should say a core idea to the founding of the United States is founded by, uh, you know, a lot of the, the documents from the founding fathers and from the earliest um, explorers of the continent from, from England and France uh, were, you know, filled with this, this idea of this, you know, savage natural world that needed to be tamed by Europeans. Um, and so this is part of our, you know, the, the ethos of this whole, of our whole country here. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I think, I think guilt is a motivating force and I think it, it is felt and, and it, it, it can be used in productive ways. And, and I think it's being, it's being used more and more now in, in some of this intergenerational um, rhetoric yeah. that you see from climate activists, the younger generations holding the older generations responsible. I think that will intensify uh, only as we as we move forward. Yeah, uh, let's hope that that becomes, uh, you know, that movement becomes something that tips the balance in terms of uh, popular opinion, you know, in, in, in the same way that, you know, anti-slavery movement or, or suffragettes movement, you know, it, it got to a point in society which it then became more widely accepted. And, you know, that emergent intergenerational sort of discussion, I think is a very interesting one to watch. And it's something that we, we kind of encourage, we, we believe yeah. in that. Um, yeah, I, just to sort of wrap up, I, I guess it's, you may have already answered it, but looking at the future, you know, are you optimistic that, it, that humans can have an ethical and dignified relationship with, with nature? Or, you know, if the answer is yes, how do we get there? If the answer is no, you know, what are your, what are your fears and concerns? I guess my my feeling is that it'll be um, as always it'll be a kind of model and that mm. we'll have yeah. um, some you know that there'll be a range of responses and and probably uh, different groups of people will have different you know different responses and different successes and different and you know there'll be a kind of uh, you know I guess in the same way that I don't know human rights uh, are respected depending on where your country you're in. Um, 
what are the mores. I, I, I think some some level of you know adaptation and mitigation will just be forced um, in the same way that you just can't have slavery now. I, although I guess there are a couple of places where you can. Uh, in the, but you know, they'll, they'll be the red line will be drawn, I think, closer to a more sane place than it is now. Um, but I don't, I don't think we'll, we'll be in any kind of utopian situation uh, anytime soon. And I, and I think, um, you know, we'll, we'll be there. Will always be this question of of ethical responsibility and and you know how you know how do we get our governments to uphold um a, a basic baseline of of um moral responsibility and i think that's going to be a fight that will be with us as long as there's you know human civilization yeah uh, and it will it will never end and it'll always be um you know the battle lines will sort of shift but but i think what this is this is a lifelong it's really a species long you know fight to try to be our best selves and um, you know, one hopes that we get better than we are are now. Um, and I think I think we will. But but you know, as with everything with environmental issues and climate issues, that's you know, there's a wide spectrum of outcomes still available to us. Uh, I don't think we'll be you know at, at at one far end or another. I think we'll be somewhere in between. And, and some really wonderful things that will happen, and there'll be some really uh, horrific things that will happen. Um, and it will be, uh, as always, it will be distributed unevenly. Um, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and I think the, the bigger question is how do we engage? How do we um, have this conversation? How do we open up our imaginations to um, not just the, the policy and, and, and what's required, but, but to, to sort of a greater contemplation of where, where each of us uh, stand in it? And, and how to understand the ways in which, um, you know, to basically construct our own personal lives around um, the, the, the difficulty and the chaos of, of, of what's coming. Uh, and I think that, that personal battle and, and, and negotiation is, uh, is, is what is you know, before all of us. And that, that's what I find myself writing about again and again, um, more than the sort of big picture issues, you know, how does, how do each of us as individuals navigate uh, these waters? Um, and and that will always be, that, that struggle I think will always be with us. Well, I, I think you, your book, Second Nature, certainly kind of adds to that whole discussion in, in, in a truly fascinating way. And, and congratulations on, on the book. It's, it's, it's been a, a great read. And, um, and uh, we, we hope that we look forward to, to future books. Do you, do you have plans? Do you have in your mind, you must have a gestation of an idea or is that perhaps giving, yeah. giving too much away? I have a, a novel and a and a nonfiction uh, idea. Great, unique for me. I have more than one idea at once, but I'm that's what I'm working on now. Um, uh, yeah, historical nonfiction idea that uh, I'm excited about, and a novel I'm excited about as well. So I'm just in the early phases of those. Excellent, that's fantastic. Well, thank you, thank you very much indeed. We, uh, we've enjoyed hugely speaking to Nathaniel Rich on his book, uh, Second Nature. Um, definitely recommend to, to go out and buy it and read it. We look forward to future books from you, Nathaniel, and, and thank you very much for, for taking the time to speak to us. Thanks for having me. It was great, great talking to you. Thank, thank you. you.